I hope you had a nice lunch. So um, with Erika now, we're going to do what we should have done right at the beginning of the workshop, which is introduce the workshop. <laughs> so this, uh, the scope of this uh, presentation is just to contextualize why we're here in this way. And, um, and I'm going to say something about the assessment of climate risk and how this is the tool we're, we're working around and, and it's informing the development of adaptation strategies and also going towards building resilience. So the assessment of climate risk as it was, um, it's interesting to see how it evolved in the IPCC. When you go back to the AR4 on the left, there's my man magic button, sorry. <laughs> Here we are. No, sorry, this is a really cool button that uh, people can see online, like this tool. Um, it was predominantly an assessment of impacts and uh, vulnerability. And um, as it moved over the, the assessment cycle, so AR4 was in, was it 2007, something like that? And then in the AR5, that was around 2013, 14? You see an evolution of this concept and how um, we're not talking anymore just about vulnerability to climate related and environmental related impacts, but this risk framing has emerged where there's an interplay between the climate signal, the hazards, and uh, the vulnerability of um, society and also, I suppose, the, the ecosystems with their exposure. And um, this is where the famous propeller diagram emerged. And you see these interactions, these more dynamic perspective of how hazards, vulnerability, and exposure all um, are interrelated. And you can make an assessment of the risk of these potential impacts. And um, you're bringing in both the socioeconomic dimension with the physical science dimension. And the vulnerability side also takes into consideration uh, differences within society um, so different, within a society, you'll have different vulnerabilities, and, and this is where this concept moved towards in the AR5. And I don't have to introduce this in great detail because we had a very nice talk from Elvira, but you see here the, the way it's come forward into the AR6. And so it's, it's an intersecting interplay between climate impact drivers, ecosystem and societal vulnerabilities, and their exposure but also now consideration of the response to climate change. So how you adapt or mitigate can lead to risks, obviously. It can lead to consequences that you need to consider. On the working group one side, we have, as you've already heard, this um, multi-hazard approach to the assessment of the climate uh, consequences. And the assessment has shown how um, drivers of impacts are becoming larger with increasing global warming, the frequency is increasing, they're appearing in new locations with different timings, there are concurrent or compound or cascading um, effects. And just as a reminder, we, when we look at the vulnerability, we're talking about 3.3 to 3.6 billion people who are currently living in highly vulnerable con contexts. And we're also talking about ecosystems. With exposure, for example, 1 billion people are exposed to sea level rise uh, by 2050. And when you talk about responses, here we're, we're thinking about uh, the consequences, for example, of pressures on land, of, um, for example, mitigation actions, and lock-in coming from these mitigation, res these responses that can lead to maladaptation. And so the diagram has become really complicated. So you see all these little symbols. They show when there are bidirectional, so going between vulnerability and hazard. You have unidirectional effects. You have effects that aggregate, that cascade. Um, so, so here is the framework within which the AR6 assessed risk. So this very nice figure, which um, Ilvi already showed, shows you how they intersect with positive and, and, and negative consequences, moving around the circle, climate change, the effects on much more integrating the consequences for ecosystems and biodiversity in the assessment and human society. And I think um, Working Group 2 really took this concept to another level, in, in sort of showing evidence for how, considering all these interlinkages together, actually you can um, not only adapt, but, and not only incrementally adapt, but you can sort of undertake transformative approaches where you take a systems-based approach to considering the picture as a whole, and then there is a possibility of actually making these links 
um, working for each other, so with, with uh, positive consequences, in fact, depending on how you take into account human systems, um, governance aspects, participation, justice and equity, how you look at ecosystems and their services as a, a, you know, almost on an equal footing with the human systems and, um, and future climate change consequences. So in practice, and this isn't IPCC stuff, this is from a new, uh, my new position right now, it's a project I'm working on, Climax, in the European context, it's really interesting to see when you do a comprehensive review of, um, it's mainly grey and white literature, of what um, currently national adaptation plans and strategies, how, how they're actually handling the climate risk assessment. And when you go through this list of, uh, con you know, our, our evaluation of these plans and strategies, you see that we're, in actual fact, we're still in the AR4 days. And this is why I showed you this history. We're actually, in practice, still at the AR4 days, mainly considering an assessment of impacts and perhaps vulnerability. But there's, um, in fact, a need to include risk still in many cases. It's quite remarkable. And the move towards a more complex systems approach, also the multi-hazard um, compound and cascading risk approach. So what you often see is that vulnerability and exposure are compounding or conf confounding. So it's, it's hard to unpack vulnerability and exposure in these strategies. And there is starting to be an inclusion of, of response uh, effects, but it's, it's a novelty, I suppose, in the consideration of risk. And extending the assessment of risk beyond monetary terms, so non-monetary terms as well. Some uh, positives are that you see an increasing awareness of maladaptation. You do see the involvement of stakeholders in the co-design process, and there are many good practice examples. So there's a chance to learn and share experiences. So this is a European context, but I think it's probably um, comparable in other parts of the world. Just to show you, still in Europe, um, how international cooperation is important um, when you're looking at um, building sort of transformative change um, in how you approach climate change uh, risks. So um, there's a Green New Deal, it's called, in Europe. And there's a mitigation-orientated part of that, but there's also an adaptation mission. And it's really interesting to see how this works in, a, in, an, in an international context. So there's an effort to coordinate uh, growth of capacity across different types of players. Obviously, you, you all know how heterogeneous this, this landscape is. So we're talking about local authorities, uh, regional administrations, national administrations, also sectoral um, uh, administration, uh, I suppose. So in, in the EU, there's um, funding which is actually going in towards helping, uh, I suppose, in a case study approach to build capacity from the ground. So it's this, this project that I'm involved with isn't a research project. It's more an implementation project. And it's research in itself, in fact. It's really interesting. So you go from the bottom where you're trying to build preparedness and awareness of climate risks. Because as I said, we're, we're in the AR4 days still, so there's lots of road still to do. And then there are um, some very good examples already out there. So you can build and strengthen these examples into um, demonstrations of how you accelerate the transition to designing um, enabling conditions and <coughs> solutions in this transformative framing. And this particular uh, mission approach is aiming to, I think it's by 2030, elevate at 75, they aim for 75 um, case examples where they're building resilience, in fact, in their planning. So the way in Europe it's working is that there is this heterogeneous landscape and you try and develop a sort of bring everyone up to a standard and then show by learning how you can actually implement um, these, these conceptual ideas that I was showing you from the IPCC. So back to the workshop. And I think it's really interesting to see how, on the one hand, we hear a lot about the IPCC assessments. It's important because it speaks to sort of global scale coordination and, and cooperation and UNFCCC, you heard uh, from Yuri this morning. But it also sets standards. So you, when we looked at those risk framings, how they've evolved over time, they are setting the standards, best practices for um, all parties to, to look at. And I think here, we're, we're on the one hand, we have we're bringing together the communities who are working on the ground on the research that advances our understanding of risk and the methodologies. But also, this context can create a, a sort of growth of capacity in your local country you know, context, whether you're working at a you know, national or local scale, 
we have a really nice opportunity here for cross-feeding between the IPCC on the one and the higher end, I suppose, which is quite conceptual in some regards, how to improve the presentation of the IPCC, aggregating the knowledge that you're generating, and on the other hand, bringing these best practices down to the local contextualized research and, and activities that you're, you may be involved with. So this was a bit our motivation, I suppose. We have a nice program, and I just introduce it very quickly. I hope you can read it. So the, the times are a bit rough. This was a kind of um, sketch program. So don't look at the times. You have a more detailed agenda. But you see some colors. And just to explain the motivation, so on the blue, we're thinking of having some more kind of, um, I guess there's a bit like lectures uh, on, on sort of the latest knowledge, be it from the assessment process, but also from other activities that is really pushing the boundaries of the assessment of climate risks in sea you know, different sectors in a way, sea level and coastal risks, ecosystems, biodiversity, agriculture and land use. We have health and we have um, water security. And, and the, you'll see these are really nice. What we try to do is bring working group one type people and working group two type people together. And um, it won't be just a boring lecture, I think. You'll see various different formats. And we try and intersect these two parts of the world. And then we have um, what you can see as green. I picked the green ones. These are sort of soft skill development sessions. And in the IPCC process, we really had a nice experience working with experts in communication, visual design, outreach, and data science. And uh, we think that it's worthwhile to share these experiences and, and maybe introduce you to some of the techniques and methods. Because as a scientist, you probably find yourself often trying to answer questions from your local authority or from stakeholders in your region. And people are really interested in your research. The idea here is that you take these skills forward and uh, make your research more widely known and impactful. And then we have um, a couple of talks. One is on information design on Wednesday, a really interesting one coming on Friday, which picks up this issue of relating to the, um, the development of policies themselves. This is an invited talk looking at going from research to the policy sphere. And then we have a really nice um, road that goes through the workshop, which is the yellow, and you'll hear about it in a minute. And this is where we want to discuss with you, because this is a workshop. It's not like teaching stuff. We, you have expertise that's unique. In a way, we're kind of bringing this all together, and we're going to start discussing what the priorities are from a research perspective, but also thinking about these you know, international cooperation, international assessment or, or regional assessments. And so soon you'll hear how this will work. But we're trying to develop a collective piece of, not, I don't know, perspective of what's coming out from this discussion during this week. I think that's all I can say at this stage. Maybe Erika can compliment as well. Yeah, so just to tell a bit of the story. So initially, this workshop was uh, uh, designated. So we spoke with Anna a lot. I mean, we share the same institute, we are yeah, both of us. So over coffee, we were discussing and thinking about how can we um, directly get uh, to, the, um, to the stakeholder that is you of the APCC um, um, information. And this was originally scheduled for the TS writing workshop that was, uh, was back to back to the TS writing workshop that was here in Trieste before the COVID. So the idea was that your feedback could also come to us directly during, still during the IPCC process. But this was, of course, not possible because we had COVID, and then the work, workshop got postponed. But that, this, just to tell you that, already from the beginning when this workshop was, uh, um, let's say, taught or invented <laughs> or um, kind of shaped, uh, was because we wanted to, uh, to know how uh, could we um, improve the um, IPCC uh, process. If, we, if, if there is something that we have done that it's, for us, it looks very important instead for the stakeholder community, but also for the research community, it's not. And also if you, how this could be changed. I mean, if, if you see that there is an alternative way to shape the, uh, for example, the storyline across the working group, the three working group, or the way in which the information is treated. So this was the original intention of the workshop, and still it is today. This is why you see this uh, different color. In particular, when I just want to put a, a 
to highlight the yellow one because uh, next what, next uh, after us there will be uh, the, this session, the yellow session starting. So during this yellow session, what we want is really interact with you. And then Sarah will introduce how the section will uh, gonna be today. And also during the talk from you tomorrow on Wednesday, your talk has to be, of course, we will listen to you, but also think about giving your talk as an input for us uh, to understand which, which are the answer to the question that I asked you before. And also think about the question that have been shared with you before the workshop. Uh, so this is really what we want to know from you during this yellow session and all across uh, the, um, the workshop. Um, and I think this is what mostly what the workshop is about.